Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jessica Zavala, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Ohio Program for Campus Safety and Mental Health to today's webinar, Pioneering a Path Forward, Engaging and Understanding the Vitality of Needs for Latinx Students. Uh, we really look forward to today's discussion surrounding identifying practical strategies to encourage engagement and understanding um, Hispanic and Latinx students to improve outcomes of the student experience, learning how to enhance a safe space for connection within the framework of cultural humility, and recognizing barriers that prevent access to service utilization include educational, campus community, and mental health care. I do have a few brief announcements to share. First and foremost, CME and CEU credits are available. Um, the activity code for today's session is 27 goals. That's 27 G-O-E-S. This code will expire on November 9th at 12 p.m. Um, please be on the lookout for information periodically posted within the chat um, regarding how to obtain credits if you are interested. Next, we invite you to join us for our next webinar on January 26th at 12 p.m. as we welcome Dr. Sarah Abelson from Temple University's The Hope Center to discuss wellness strategies for first-generation students. Um, please make sure you stay tuned for future webinar topics, and please be on the lookout for um, other details via our listserv and social media sites for other upcoming events. Um, we also encourage you to post questions and comments um, for today's panel discussion and the Q&A and or chat function um, as we look to have an interactive discussion today. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and the video will be made available on our YouTube channel. And now I would like to provide an opportunity for our distinguished panelists to introduce themselves. And first I will kick it over to Dr. Magda Gomez, who is the Executive Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Kaga Community College. Dr. Gomez. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for inviting me to serve on this wonderful panel um, today. Um, I'm just very grateful to be able to share our insights from Cuyahoga Community College. And um, just wanna say, you know, in terms of the work that I do at the college, um, I've been at the college for over 10 years. Um, it, my work mostly centers around um, moving through this inclusive excellence journey, because we say this work is never done. It's an ongoing process. We're constantly finding ways in which we could create um, an environment where everyone feels welcome and safe and understood. Um, and in that space, you know, we create opportunities for our employees, our faculty, and our staff to um, receive professional development in the area of DEI. Um, and also providing executive sponsorship and support for our employee resource groups, which we have five at the institution. Um, and more importantly, we provide support to our students through the resource groups there. Um, among these are the Hispanic Council, the um, Black American Council, and the SOGI Council. Some of these have been around for decades. Um, I know that the Black American Council has been uh, originated as a Black caucus and um, back in 1963 when the institution actually began. Um, and it's since um, evolved into supporting students um, and became the Black American Council. The Hispanic Council has been around and you'll hear from Jessica for over 30 years. And we even have an established endowment to help support our students. And then of course the SOGI Council, the Sexual Orientation Gender Equality Council and the Lambda groups um, also received support from, from my office, from the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, in terms of supporting um, Hispanics and engaging our Hispanics um, in the community and internally as well, um, we're just so grateful for the partnerships that we have um, and ongoing connections that we build in the community. 
Uh, I can go on about how in, in recent years, especially after Hurricane Maria, we established Bienvenidos at Cleveland in which we engaged over 25 different community-based partners um, to, to work together and collaborate to provide the support needed for um, our citizens that arrived to the mainland from Puerto Rico. Um, and of course, Cleveland had an influx and we'll talk about the population growth as a result, but I'll leave that there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gomez. And now we'll turn it over to Jessica Cartagena, who is the program manager and with the Hispanic Council, also with Cala Community College. Jessica. Hi, good morning slash afternoon, everyone. Um, I am proud to be serving as a program manager for the Hispanic Council here at Tri-C. As Dr. Gomez stated, we've been in existence for over 30 years. We started as kind of a brainchild of one of our academic counselors that wanted to provide extra support for Hispanic students. So it has grown. We are a two-person team, small but mighty. Uh, we have an endowment that we offer scholarships to anywhere between 80 to 100 students every academic year. And we just serve as a touch point for the community. Many folks call us just to start with the registration, enrollment, helping with um, their financial aid, and we provide that assistance to, to our students. Um, right now, we, we're serving probably a, getting close to like 1,400 uh, Latino students here at Tri-C. Really proud of that. Um, I'm located physically at our Western campus within our multicultural centers that opened kind of during the pandemic, and they're great hubs at all our campuses for students to kind of come and seek extra support. So excited to be here and learn from many of my colleagues on this call. Thank you, Jessica. And now we'll hear from Alejandro Martinez Jr., who is a clinical social worker at Tele Ayuda, Ohio. Good morning, everyone. Um, and again, thank you all for having me too. Uh, I, like was said, my name is Alejandro Martinez. I use he, him, his, él is my pronouns. And I'm actually a former student affairs professional myself as well. I've worked in the past at Case Western Reserve, Oberlin College, and Washington University in St. Louis, where I worked in a variety of roles spanning residence life, uh, fraternity and sorority life, multicultural affairs, and student leadership. Uh, of course, in many of those roles, I was a big support for students often enduring a variety of different mental health challenges as they you know, navigate the stressors of academics, identity development, and mental health. And working at predominantly white institutions, I was often also sought out quickly by Latinx students uh, and Latinx student organizations simply because a lot of times there were only a handful of Latinx staff. And oftentimes those students could relate a bit more to me and my cultural experiences compared to, to non-Latinx staff members. Now, currently, though, I work as a mental health therapist with De La Ayuda, Ohio, and I'm based in Cleveland. Um, with De La Ayuda, um, we are a team of Latinx psychotherapists uh, who work to serve the Latino community throughout the state of Ohio. And so given my experience with students, um, I work primarily with high schoolers and college level students, as well as adults who are struggling with post-traumatic symptoms, symptoms of depression or anxiety and, and identity development and growth. I um, mean, currently I actually am one of the very, very few Spanish speaking uh, Latino male therapists here in the state. Thank you for having me again. Thank you so much, Alejandro. And now we will hear from Neomet's own Iris Morales, who is the Assistant Director of Student. Good morning, everybody. I'm honored to be here with you, and I am so excited to, to really dive into this topic. I'm very passionate about access to education, particularly for underrepresented students and families. And I say families because the important tie that often occurs with students as they enter into a collegiate setting. I've been in higher education for 18 and a half years. The mo bulk of my time so far has been in four-year public institutions, where I was at Wright State University and then at Kent State University and now at Neomed. Much of that time was also spent helping students and families navigate the enrollment processes. So admissions and financial aid, I would spend time in the high schools and I really valued the opportunity to provide that 
access and that touch point to that next step for students and their families. What I get to do now at NeoMed as the Assistant Director of Student Diversity in working very closely with our Assistant Dean of Student Diversity, Dr. Alita Lodi, is working with students as they're onboarded through our admissions process, on through through retention activities, just giving them that opportunity to have a really personal touch. I co-advise the Latino Medical Student Association and the Student National Medical Association. So it's so good to be here with you all today. And we're so excited um, as the Ohio Program for Campus Safety and Mental Health to really host this, this very vital and important discussion. And, with that being said, um, Dr. Gomez, you did mention something about the population, and, and certainly we know that you know the demographics has changed and continue to change. And we know that according to some estimates, um, the Hispanic and Latinx population, even here in the state of Ohio, um, has been known or is estimated to double, double really since to 2000, the year of 2000. Um, and is even experienced a rapid diversification. Would you agree with that statement or that data? And if so, how can campuses prepare for this, this change and this growth in, in data and demographics for that increase in Hispanic and Latinx students? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, so as you may know, in Cuyahoga County, um, the largest population of Hispanics and Latinos reside in the city of Cleveland. And at this present time, um, comprise about 13.1% of the overall population in Cleveland. Um, and that follows the, um, the growth in population of the inner ring um, and outer ring suburbs, like some suburbs like Parma, Parma Heights, and Brooklyn, as an example, have surprised us all in terms of the growth in the last 10 years, where we see this influx of Latinos moving into these, um, these uh, communities. And so, and according to the US census of 2020, the population of Latinos, Hispanics and Latinos in Cuyahoga County grew by 36% um, and overall by 6.1% um, the total population. And so, you know, due to this population growth um, of Hispanics and Latinx individuals, we need to view this not only as an opportunity but certainly as colleges, colleges and universities, um, we need to view it as an imperative um, to prepare our new uh, generations of potential students as well as adult learners um, entering the workforce um, and creating an overall impact of the economic growth of our region. Um, and with that, we must be intentional. And it need, we need to be intentional in our outreach and providing opportunities um, in this space and setting measurable goals and benchmarks that could potentially lead to us becoming even um, Hispanic serving institutions, which is one of the things that at Tri-C we've been most recently considering. Um, we've never um, really talked about that. We've never really had that conversation, but understanding now um, because of this growth, and also, I don't know if you knew this, but at Tri-C we have a new campus president who just started um, this fiscal year, and we're very excited about the prospect of working with him um, to move in that direction to becoming a Hispanic serving institution. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's um, an institution that has an enrollment of 25% or more of Hispanic Latinx students. Um, there is such a thing too as becoming an emerging HSI, which is about 15% um, that leads to that lofty goal. But certainly for us, um, it is a lofty goal, but we, we intend on working in that direction and, and trying to engage our partners and our community as a result. And Jessica and I just most recently were having a, a conversation because we're in the process of coordinating an event here at the college at Tri-C. We're calling it Unidos por la Educación. And it's important, we call it that and we brand it that because it's really an invitation to our Hispanic uh, stakeholders and our organizations that serve um, Hispanics um, in our community to engage them um, in this goal to establish themselves as partners in this effort. So those are just some things that I wanted to share. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gomez, for providing that information. And, and Jessica, just to kind of expand on that, again, we're talking about the um, anticipated change in demographics, and certainly we even know, according to the research, 
that it, that population also for students is expected to um, exceed 4.1 million students nationwide by 2026. Um, what can administrators and leadership do to, to improve not only, because we know there's some constraints, right? Um, and barriers to program utilization, but also to even improve the student experience. Yeah, thank you. That's, you know, as establishment of offices like mine in an institution, right? That that definitely helps that students know that there is someone that A, speaks their language, that they could come and, you know, ask questions. And I think that, um, I think as an institution, we've established our first year experience class for all our students, which has been beneficial as well. Um, what I have found, and you know, once students kind of get that, as we say, that confianza, like that we're friends, we're like, they like, okay, she's cool, I could trust her. Just that we could like sometimes, you know, they'll ask me like a question that you would think like, well, what does FAFSA actually stand for, right? I think that sometimes, especially in higher ed, we love acronyms because it because we go a mile a minute, but not everyone understands that and not, you know, it's first generation and student week, but do students even understand what that means. Sometimes I have to explain what that means. And you know, in different Latin countries, a bachelor's sometimes equals high school diploma. So that also creates some confusion. Um, I think one thing that I've, I've learned is it's a completely a family approach. It's the student has to be comfortable and the parent needs to be comfortable or whoever their support system is. Um, so we, we have toys in our office because we get many students that come in with their children and family members. And one day we had, I think about 15 people all and but it 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 adds the students asking the question and the mom will say well maybe I can go back or I've thought about it and it's just really creating like as I said like that that trust with students um and offering all the resources I, I think I, I've handheld literally walk students to our career services there's a there's a great deal of opportunity for students on college campuses to excel but many times they're just kind of not sure where to go or is that for me so you know and I think that's what administrators need to do we need to all promote all the great services that we do thank you so much for that Jessica and I think what you're really even getting at is really creating that sense of belonging and that that culture of care and so Iris um, let's talk about really even the role of, of language and self-identification right which I think will fall under that that sense of belonging and, and, and really how students generationally might be able to identify that sense of belonging, right? So can you maybe shed some light on that topic and perhaps even in your role here um, in higher education, um, how do Latinx students really prefer um, that they be acknowledged? I will answer that question, but I want to address uh, something that Jessica said, and if I might also address the previous question, I because Neomed, I think right now is currently in the process of really looking at this, is that faculty need to represent the student body. It is so important, I believe, that there be Latino, Latina, Latinx faculty that students see. And I know that we've got some work to do as four-year publics and professional schools and in the high school setting, but that is so important, right? So I just had to say that because I'm living that right now, but I'll gladly answer your, your next question uh, around language. And I have a disclaimer and something that, that may be something that someone else is experiencing. So I think it's important. I think it's important to, to realize that not all Latinos have the same experience. Not all Latinos have the same uh, cultural experience. I always say to my colleagues that a Latino from Florida is not, does not have the same experience as a Latino from Ohio, from Texas, from New York, you know, it, it's, it's going to vary. Um, and as part of that, language can also have a variance, variance in different dialects that we speak. And some folks may not speak fluently, 
I don't speak fluently. There's a reason kind of behind that. And that has to do with some of the generational stuff that you talked about, Jessica. You know, uh, someone who is first generation Latino versus second generation Latino versus third generation and so on and so forth, or who may have a blend of cultures, right? They may or may not speak the language. For me, um, my grandfather came here as a migrant farm work worker in the state of Ohio and stayed here. He joined the military, did the World War II thing, came back, established himself um, as, as a blue collar worker. Um, and, and then after that, he had kids. And when my dad went to school at that time in the, the 60s, it was very much assimilation for self-preservation for good, bad, or otherwise. So my dad did not speak the language fluently and was in fact broken from speaking that. Now I share that not to get all in the weeds, but just to let you know that folks experience the culture differently, but language remains very, very important and very important for a lot of our students. Some of the things that we see happen um, at Neomed and I've seen happen at other four-year public institutions that I've been a part of, Students will gather at lunch to speak with one another because, as I believe Jessica said, it feels like home. It creates that sense of belonging. And so um, our students tend to do that. Um, sometimes we schedule intentional opportunities for community where language is exchanged um, and stories are in exchanged because the stories are so important. Uh, but all of that to say that everybody's experience is different. Language is important, but it may have a different variance depending upon who you are and what your journey is. And so if you're an educator and you have a question about that, um, be mindful. I think we're going to talk a little bit about cultural humility um, and, and respect for others' cultures. Don't assume everyone speaks Spanish or they speak a specific dialect. Um, ask. Ask with compassion. Um, and, and I'm sure you'll, you'll find out the information that you need to know in a way that will be comfortable to the students. Thank you so much for, for that. And we certainly appreciate the intentionality piece and certainly the compassion piece and, and asking with compassion. And, and Alejandro, I want to kick it over to you. Um, of course, similar to um, many on this panel, you have held, and you talked about this in your introduction, many distinct roles in, in higher education. And now you are solely um, involved in providing direct services to the Hispanic Latinx community. What advice would you share with your fellow panelists um, and even our listeners here um, today regarding advocacy for mental health programs in higher education for Latinx students? What would you share? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot that can be done, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you know, over the past few weeks during uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, a lot of um, campuses, student groups kind of reached out and were like, hey, we'd love to do a program on, on mental health and just talking about it more. And so I think it's important that, you know, to have speakers, workshops, and events that highlight and talk about mental health openly um, that are sponsored by academic and campus departments. You know, I, I remember hearing a lot of times when I was in higher ed from, from the students, this feeling that they had a program for themselves and didn't necessarily feel that there was institutional support if they wanted to bring in a speaker or if they wanted to touch on a specific topic for an event. Um, and I think it causes this rift then between the students and the staff and faculty, right? So I think if we're able to be intentional with those programs, students can then benefit by learning, you know, how to identify mental health illnesses, how mental health services can treat uh, those illnesses and the importance of taking an individual with a mental illness to receive mental health care. Um, Unfortunately, in the Hispanic Latinx community, stigma around mental health is really big. Um, it is a very taboo topic in a lot of the communities. And so even just saying we're hosting an event talking about depression, talking about anxiety can help destigmatize it and support others in seeking that um, mental health care that they need. I think similarly, um, I think someone had mentioned this earlier, right? What does it look like for to have more Latinx staff and faculty? Um, and unfortunately, we're in Ohio, right? We're not necessarily bringing in all the Latinx folks into our state or even into the Cleveland-Akron area. Um, but I think 
thinking about our counseling centers and faculty and staff, how can we increase awareness about Latinx cultures and broader experiences that our students may have had that then impact them once they're on campus? You know, and looking at counseling centers in particular, I think increasing awareness about Latinx values, Latinx um, trends, and how to provide Latinx students with a more comprehensive, culturally affirming mental health care can then help minimize errors and diagnoses and treatment and assessment. Um, so what does training look like then for our staff, our faculty, um, to help people be knowledgeable about the importance of different religions and family and acculturation experiences in the lives of our Latinx students. Um, and I think lastly, I would also say, we gotta get the parents involved, which I think Dr. Gomez um, and Jessica both mentioned, right? Uh, given that the cultural value of familismo, so this idea of the importance of family loyalty and closeness, it's really important in the Latinx community. So I think it's important to target this value when then designing and implementing mental health programs for Latinx students on campus. You know, programs that center on parental and familial engagement may be especially important and help to foster and maintain a student's sense of social support and emotional closeness to members of their family, especially when they're struggling. Um, someone had mentioned earlier being a first generation student, right? I remember working with first gen students who wouldn't even wanna necessarily tell their parents about what was going on on campus. Um, and I mean, first generation as a first and go to college, not necessarily first generation Latino, uh, but they wouldn't wanna tell their parents about what was going on because it was just too much to explain. And so they would just kind of remain tight-lipped about it, right? And so I think if we're able to bring that family and uh, parental support in somehow with regards to mental health programs, it can be helpful in reducing anxiety and depressive symptoms among Latinx students who oftentimes report experiencing significant levels of acculturative stress or maybe enrolled in institutions where maybe they feel some sort of ethnic-based discrimination that's more prominent for them. Thank you, Alejandro. You, you bring up a couple different points about, um, you know, again, students speaking up and, you know, programming that's really centered around, you know, students being involved. And I certainly believe in the concept of nothing about us without us, but I just want to pose this next question to Dr. Gomez, because certainly I recognize that students may not be very comfortable or really willing at all times to speak up. And so, and, and recognizing power structures, uh, traditionally speaking up and out may not really be acceptable, right? Um, culturally for Latinx students. Um, how would you encourage uh, a student to, let's say interact with someone in academia, um, let's say they may be experiencing a challenge, perhaps a microaggression um, with, so that they don't impact the overall student experience? Because that very well may be a challenge for them. So yeah, it's a great question. We consider um, our student experiences in the classroom. And, um, you know, I I'm always someone who's constantly um, proponent of educating, educating our, um, our students about these terms and concepts, um, microaggressions being one of them and micro insults. Um, I think often if you don't know what you what to call it, you you know it could remain a feeling, a feeling of being devalued, a feeling of being a feeling offended, um, and emotionally draining for our students, which you don't want to happen. Um, and these can will certainly negatively impact um, their overall classroom experience. So I think it's important that we introduce um, just call it what it is. It's diversity, equity, and inclusion training, right, for students. Um, it's understanding what those terms and con concepts mean um, from the historical context as well of the impact of the negative stereotypes that arise from these, these um, examples of microaggressions and behaviors um, that they have on us as individuals, most certainly. Um, and so we have to help our students self-advocate. That's important and necessary. So once they learn um, you know, what to call the experience, um, they could, you know, understand what has happened and most certainly, again, self-advocate and, and, you know, be open and have a voice to express what they're feeling. Um, it's important, too, that um, students feel like they have a safe space for expressing themselves in that vein um, and also a place where they can express their concerns um, on the campus. 
and have the concerns addressed appropriately. So we have to have mechanisms in place. Um, at the college at Tri-C, we do have an electronic method for students to um, express you know, what is happening to them if it's something very blatant that they desperately need to have addressed by people who could support them. And so that's, again, important for all institutions to consider. But I also want to allude to the fact that, yes, we're helping our students self-advocate, but we also need to continue to push for um, our staff and our faculty to become trained and educated as well and understand what it means to be um, culturally inclusive and welcoming and respectful and honoring our students. You know, when I consider students who um, perhaps want to include a preferred name, preferred pronouns, um, we have something in place for students to do that through our This Is Me campaign, we, which we released several years ago um, to ensure and move toward inclusivity. And so it's continually educating our faculty and staff to honor these, um, these things, right? So if you see um, that student's name um, that appears on the roster, you know, call them what they prefer to be called and honor them and respect them in that way. Um, and training them as well on all of the um, negative behaviors that could potentially occur when you're saying the wrong things, because oftentimes they're not intentional. Um, it's just what you don't know, right? And so we're constantly educating people and helping them understand what, what this means and understanding from an introspective lens, you know, how you would like to be treated, you know, and, and certainly using that platinum rule, um, how others would like to be treated. And so you know, it's back to basics constantly, and we're constantly doing that. So every semester, and Jessica could tell you, um, we just recently released a diversity, equity, and inclusion certificate program for our employees so that they could prepare themselves and really have that incentive to work towards something that would, would create some value for them, but of course, um, translate into some behavior change, which, as you know, is hard to measure. But most certainly over time, we would hope that that would be the case, that students will, in fact, be feeling safe and welcomed and understood and respected on their campus. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Gomez. Iris, I wanted to see if you had any additional perspective on that again, um, and recognizing power structures and some of the dynamics uh, and whether or not any of this could lead to, let's say, imposter syndrome or tokenism. Yes, yes. Um, I think that imposter syndrome can be very common and for those who aren't as familiar with what that is, that speaks to the fact that even though a student is, you know, wildly intelligent and, you know, very good academically, they may still feel as though they don't belong in that space. Um, and particularly with imposter syndrome, that can lead to a number of things, including a fear of speaking up uh, when they experience micro insults or microaggression or racism, for that matter. Uh, but when we talk about imposter syndrome, I think that as you interact with students, you have an opportunity, you know, regularly to affirm their um, ability and their right to be there, that, they, that they're supposed to be there. Um, and even at the professional level, even with student doctors, I have experienced students say things that that alludes to the fact that they don't belong or they don't believe that they can do it or they shouldn't be there. And each time I have that interaction with a student, I, I say to them, you're supposed to be here. You're doing a great job just reaffirming that. Um, but, you know, along the same lines, I think some potential consequences to success if, if you have imposter sy syndrome, folks may think, if I win, then someone else doesn't win. And I might feel badly about that. Like my success, you know, might mean that my family is less successful because I have to take time away from my family life. And so it's finding that balance, right? Um, if I'm too successful or academically competitive, does that leave me isolated from my classmates, from my colleagues as I continue through my career? Um, and again, that connection with family and, and community, right? Um, so I think imposter syndrome plagues, you know, marginalized populations, certainly women, but certainly, you know, Latinx students. I, I think that that can happen, and, and I've seen it over the course of my years. And to that, I would say every interaction that you have with a student is an opportunity to be proud of them, to affirm with them their place uh, on your campus uh, and in your community. 
Thank you so much, Iris. And I guess to continue in the vein of, of affirmations and, and making connections, um, Jessica, I'd really like to pose this next question towards you and the opportunity really to, um, to build some genuine connections, right? And I, I know perhaps within your role with the Hispanic Council, perhaps you can share not only with um, your fellow panelists here, but um, perhaps some faculty members who may be joining us today on the call um, who may want to know, how do I make this safe connection uh, with uh, students? Or we may even have a student today um, who's interested in learning more about allyship with uh, another student who may be of Hispanic or um, Latinx background. What would you share? What would you offer? You know, I think kind of going off of what Iris was saying, it's really, I think the student needs to feel that I am also like cheering you on. You know, many for many students that come through our doors, it was a big step just to take the decision to come to Tri-C. Also, many students may have failed at another four-year institution, so they are giving it another shot, right? They're giving college another shot. This is closer to home. And so it's really having that conversation like, okay, you're here, you're, you're enrolled, so what's your, what's your career goals? And many times I've found that I stumped them with that question, especially our ESL students that it's like, whoa, I just immigrated to a new country. I just want to learn the language. And I say, so what's happening next after your classes? So I feel that they start feeling that connection like, oh, wait, this is a uh, educational institution, there the possibilities are endless. So it's really, you know, gaining that trust, as I mentioned, I, I think that, and really building that allyship. And as I said, sometimes it's a lot of like really understanding that there are so many other resources, not just the Hispanic Council that's here to help and see them be successful. Um, I think that that's where, you know, I, the, as we all know in higher ed, it's retention is, is the name of the game, right? Getting them through the door is one, enrollment and admissions, and it's also keeping them here and seeing them be successful. Um, so um, tomorrow I'll be having a mentoring circle in collaboration with a colleague in our career services to really in, invite students to start thinking what's the next steps, because I know that there was a lot of obstacles to get here, and to maybe just enroll in that math class, but it's really start thinking beyond. Um, and it and that could happen at any age because we see, you know, moms and everyone can kind of come through our doors here. But I think it's really helping them, you know, feel that A, they belong, right? That imposter syndrome that I have and a lot of a lot of other folks have, but just that we, you know, understand that there's more, more to it. And this is just kind of the the beginning step of their journey, of their educational journey. So I, I make them go and tell me, where do you want to transfer to? And if you do want to be a doctor, you know, Neomeds in our, in our neighborhood, I, I pull up the website and I show them and then it's it, it all becomes, it becomes reality for them, right? So, and actually showing them, not just telling them, but showing them that kind of a roadmap. So you know, I, that's what I always, anyone that interacts with the student, we have that power to, you know, speak some positivity to someone and we should always take that advantage of that and, and do that, so. And I just want to add, <clears throat> Jessica, you touched on mentorship and I think that is so important. Um, seeing a near peer be successful and actually even seeing the near peer go through their own life struggles while going, that's so powerful. Um, and, and Neomed has that opportunity to have that near peer mentorship. And we also do, you know, mentorship with undergraduate uh, community as well. And I think that's powerful because there's a sense of pride, I think, in the, in the Latino community when you can say, I'm here, I've arrived and I'm reaching back to help others. So I think that mentorship, that was just a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I certainly agree with both of you. What a great touch point to talk about the mentorship and also reaching back to make the connection for someone else who may have interest in a particular career path. Thank you both for, for making that connection. Um, Alejandro, uh, you mentioned earlier about stigma and um, I certainly think it's you know not specific within one community. However, we certainly know that suicide is the third leading cause of death and 
27% of Hispanic and Latinos report high levels of depression. Perhaps you can speak a little regarding the, the barriers of why, um, let's say a, a Hispanic and Latinx student may be presenting with these symptoms and why they may not uh, seek help, right? Um, are there factors and symptoms that this audience should be aware of or any other factors, let's just say, that a student may even present with? No, absolutely. I think, yeah, like what was said, stigma, it's one of the big things, right? I think people in the Latinx community often can be, we can be very private folks and may not want to talk publicly about challenges at home or in our lives. And that's something that can kind of continue this cycle of stigma about mental health when um, I think what I said earlier was, you know, it's, it's viewed as taboo, right? Um, some folks don't want to necessarily seek treatment out uh, from fear of being labeled as crazy or locals or, or bringing shame or unwanted attention to our families. Um, and I think because of that stigma, you know, it can also then lead to more of a lack of information as then folks may not recognize those signs and symptoms of mental health conditions or even know where to seek help. Um, I think a lot of times too, the silence compounds the range of experiences that may lead to those different mental health conditions to depression and post-traumatic stress and anxiety and, and then to suicide, right? Uh, these issues like immigration, acculturation, even generational conflicts. And even when Latinx students do seek help for mental illness and suicide prevention, sometimes there are a lot of barriers and hurdles, right? Thinking about um, a lack of culturally competent mental health providers, um, costs if they have to pay out of pocket, um, or if they're low income and insurance barriers as well. Um, something I've been seeing a lot in clients I work with who are uh, currently college students is even with the idea of uh, familismo again, um, as we know, the Gladnex individuals share close bonds with family. Uh, and while that type of community can be very helpful, um, I've had folks say, you know, that a lack of interdependent values and a focus on family oriented ideals have actually kind of led to a gap in Latinx college students seeking mental health services. Um, I think because in Western culture, we're more focused on independence rather than interdependence, uh, Latinx students sometimes find themselves burdened by perceived stigma and and then are less likely to seek out campus mental health services than students who endorse independent values because that enmeshment with family might be a little bit stronger. Um, well, we don't want something to be said about our family. And so why, why seek help, right? Um, studies have actually shown too, thinking about um, immigration policy and enforcement and even deportation um, and thinking about undocumented students or, or even family members who are undocumented, right? kind of this fear of immigration enforcement um, tends to have more challenging mental health outcomes, right? Oftentimes students who have said that they fear having a loved one arrested or deported also report higher symptoms of depression and anxiety and, and PTSD. And so it can be really triggering sometimes to open up to someone, um, any one of us, right, who might be an authority figure, so to say, tell us that they or family may be at risk of deportation or have this underlying fear. And I think other factors and symptoms to keep in mind, of course, um, we got to keep in mind intersectionality and how Latinx students' other identities are impacting their mental health, um, you know, gender, sexuality, socioeconomic status, um, country of origin, or uh, we know in particular that queer Latinx youth tend to face more stressors and are also I think it's like 30 or 35% more likely to report a suicide attempt than a non-LGBT uh, Latinx youth. And I think similarly, I think it's important to keep in mind concerns happening in some of our students' home countries or family of uh, country of origin where I'm thinking even just this academic semester, right? We've seen many Latin American countries hit by natural disasters, uh, hurricanes and earthquakes and um, or even political unrest and violence which could potentially be impacting some of our students as families, um, whether extended or even in the immediate family circles, right? So I think these are all things that we have to keep in mind. And part of the reason that um, I echo what other folks have been saying so far is why we want those relationships with our students, but we wanna have that touchstone and touch points to be able to kind of know more info. And you know, if something happens, we can reach out, we can be that extra source of support that they might need.
Thank you so much, Alejandro. Anybody else want to add anything to that before I open it? Oh, open it up. Excuse me to to audience questions and or comments. Dr. Gomez, I do see that you're unmuted. Yes, thank you, Jessica, and thank you so much, Alejandro, for that um, wonderful um, insight in terms of um, how important it is to understand our students and our culture. Um, I just want to add to what Alejandro was saying um, about the importance of um, understanding that we are not a monolith. So as many uh, communities of culture, oftentimes we're asked to speak for our um, overall population of, in this case, Hispanics and Latinx um, folks, and just understanding that, that we all have, while well, we share some similarities in terms of our, our history and our culture that's um, often rooted in our history too, that we do also, because of our um, it, it own, our own lived experiences, we should never be asked to speak on, on behalf of everyone. Um, and that's important in the classroom. When you think about um, being culturally responsive um, in our teaching, um, understanding that we should never call out our students to speak on behalf of their, of their um, groups or their culture. And um, because you, you create these marginalized um, situations and again, things that you want to avoid um, and I really loved what Alejandro was saying about the intersectionality piece. That is so essential because the different layers that we bring are, you know, we obviously want to recognize those layers and understand because of all of the things that we bring, we're so multifaceted that it um, creates yet another way of looking at things from a you know, different lens for our, for our students, of course. Um, first and second and third generations of Latinos live in our communities and we have to understand all of them have different lived experiences from lang the language we speak to um, you know, how it was that we came here, um, our values, you know, they may be different. And so beyond celebrating Hispanic, Hispanics during Hispanic Heritage Month, we need to like have these conversations all year long and all the time. And it's essential, in, in, especially in this DEI learning space, as I keep mentioning. So thank you for all that. And, and I appreciate our um, other panelists with all of the great insights that you've offered. Anyone else want to contribute or offer any additional insight? And again, I, I welcome you all as um, participants today to please feel free to, to share any comments and or questions that you may have for our, our panelists today. Anybody else would like to contribute anything? that we will move to our, our final question. And I will give each panelist an opportunity to respond. So with that being said, I don't see anything that has been posted. Um, and again, Iris, I think you actually spoke to this and really everyone regarding, um, even though Hispanic and Latinx individuals may be from the same culture, it's not really the same culture and the experience certainly may not be the same for, for everyone. Um, and I'm really asking this question for, for everyone. From your perspective, what do you wish? What do you desire? If you could have, I guess, one wish um, that people understood um, more about the Hispanic and Latinx experience, or if they could gain more insight regarding what would you share? What would you say? And so, um, Dr. Gomez, I will kick it off to you first to respond. Um, I, I guess I just want to add to what I was saying earlier. It's just really important to honor who we are as individuals and what we bring. And you know, we are a very proud community. I will say that um, Alejandro did a great job when he came recently to the college to talk about. Um, mental health and what that looks like for our community. And he touched upon familismo quite a bit in understanding. And I really loved Alejandro that you used Encanto, um, which is a Disney production um, to really, you know, show some of the colorful um, nuances to that. And I really appreciate that. And of course, our students can, could appreciate that as well. So just again, just who we are, celebrating who we are most certainly and, and honoring our differences as well. I think if anything, that's most important for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Gomez. And, and so since you did highlight um, Alejandro and 
and Kanto, I have not had the opportunity to see that. I think it's only natural that I, I pose that question to Alejandro next, and perhaps he can expand a little bit on, on both of those pieces. Alejandro? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I think I would say that, summary to what we've been saying, you know, the folks of Latin American descent are not a monolith, um, although sometimes for reporting purposes or whatever, we kind of have to be or are lumped into one, you know, um, but I'm remembering even from my days as an undergrad to when I was advising students, kind of seeing that even if numbers say one thing, the actual lived experiences and um, what is it, involvement of Latinx students can vary widely. You know, uh, I would often see, you know, we could say we had a hundred Latinx students on campus, but then there would be a subsect of students who identified as such openly kind of had those more normative cultural experiences of Latin, Latinx identity and engaged in those spaces. Then you had another group of students who maybe didn't engage actively with those spaces, um, but still had those cultural experiences growing up that they related to. Then you kind of had another group who maybe were of Latin American descent, but didn't necessarily have the same cultural experiences or weren't connecting to those spaces, right? who um, Latinx on paper, so to say. So I think it's important that how are we kind of uplifting all of those and recognizing all of those? Um, because again, uh, kind of what's, I think one of the big messages from this whole webinar, right, is we're not a monolith. There's so many different experiences. Um, and I think it's important that we make spaces for our students to be able to share their own experiences and uh, allow that to be how, how we paint our work. Thank you so much, Alejandro. And I also appreciate the mental health perspective that you brought in, you know, certainly sharing regarding stigma and regarding symptoms and, you know, for students to access care. So certainly appreciate that. Jessica, I'll pass it to you next. Well, um, I just want to thank everyone for like sharing their insight. I've learned so much from all of you. Um, I definitely feel, you know, as I I see so many Hispanic students throughout my day. Um, we're definitely not all the same, but one thing is definitely very proud. So just going back to what Dr. Goma said, I think that even if they Spanish doesn't come fluently to them, or but everyone is really proud of their culture. Um, recently, in honor of Hispanic Heritage uh, Month, I put up flags in our office, and I've kept them there permanently because it does bring people joy to see that they're like home country represented. So um, I'm always like thrilled when I meet students that as Alejandro said, I'm Latino on paper and they come to me and they're like, I just wanna be part of this. I wanna learn more. And that's what we're also here for as well. So excited to have our first Latino student group here at Tri-C. Um, yeah, and, then, and I think one of the things that sparked the conversation was that we have many students that just kind of wanna practice Spanish as well and some practice English. So I think just the, the proudness that we have and really, that's something that I wish everyone, you know, kind of embraced and kind of going back more faculty, Latinx faculty, right? But I'm going to throw that out into the universe because that definitely is needed to help with Latino student success. Thank you so much, Jessica. And I think that's the first time I've heard the term um, on paper. And so that may be one that I think um, I may have to start utilizing, but I appreciate that. And I think almost in terms of allyship, maybe that could be used that, yeah, you can be this on paper and that's a way that you can support Latinx, Hispanic and Latinx students and or faculty as well. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. And then finally, Iris, I will throw it to you. I don't know what else I can add. I agree with everything everyone already said. The only thing I would say is we're not going anywhere. Like the population is growing. So all the more reason to support your Latino students. Um, and, and provide them with, with that individual touch and care that they need. Um, other than that, it's just been a great panel. Thank you, everyone. Well, again, I want to say, again, on behalf of the Ohio Program for Campus Safety and Mental Health, I certainly appreciate the expertise, the knowledge, and all of the information that you all shared. Um, certainly your time and our audience. Thank you so much for joining us on such a busy day. And one last time, if you are interested in claiming CEU codes, and I do see that it's been posted, that code again is 27GOES. 
That's 27-G-O-E-S, and that code will expire tomorrow at 12 noon. Again, thank you everyone for your participation. I wanna thank this distinguished panel today for your participation. And we hope to see you January 26th for our next webinar at 12 noon. Thank you and have a great rest of your afternoon. Goodbye.